a very, very, very recent story. It's only about half a millennia old, so uh, you know, it's kind of very, very recent. This is a story about Conor O'Quinn. And Conor O'Quinn was the last of the great chiefs of the Quinn family, the Quinn family, that kind of rolled down the Clare. And of course, his family had been losing power and losing influence by the time Conor became the chief there. And it was a terrible, terrible thing when the chief of a clan had lost so much power. He was trying to build up alliances again, and trying to build up prestige again, and all the while struggling and struggling just to keep his head above water. But the one thing that kept him going is he had a little ritual that kind of filled his heart. And it was this. He lived in a great castle. Beside the castle was a lake. And at the top of the lake was some ruins. And what he would do of an evening is he would walk from his castle and he'd walk the full length of the lake and he'd come up to the ruins and he'd just sit there and he'd just rest and breathe in. Because this is the ruin of the great fort that the Quins had many, many years ago. And there were so many legends and stories about this fort. Every time the Quins were almost about to lose, almost about to lose their power, it was the last stance, and the move was also the last stance at this point. And it always win the day, and it always went back to the power. And so, Conor would go, and he'd sit amongst the ruin, <coughs> and he'd just think about his ancestors, and he'd breathe deep, and he'd relax. Now, one evening, he took the walk. And he went up to the ruins, and he was sitting there. And sure as he was sitting there relaxing, he looked out over the lake. And he saw in the lake three white shapes. And he watched them, and he came closer, and he saw it was three very beautiful swans. And the swans were on the water, and they were moving about, and the swans seemed to be looking for somewhere to land. And Connor thought, if I hide, they might land just where I am. So he hid behind a rock, and sure enough, the three swans, they came over the water, and they came all the way up to the top of the lake, and they looked about, and then stepped onto the shore there. And when they stepped onto the shore, they done what all swans do. Stretched out their wings and bent their necks, and their sail all stretched out. And Connor was watching them, and a strange thing happened. As they stretched all the way back, their bodies spilled over. And the swan forms spilled over like cloaks, and out stepped three beautiful women. And they looked about, and they walked along the shore, and they found a field, and they stood in the field, and they began to dance. And as they were dancing, the sun was setting. And as if they were attached to each other by a wave, as one moved around, the other two moved around. As one turned, the other two turned. And it was the most beautiful thing that Colin had seen. And the sky, the sun was like their arms golden and red, and their hair was golden. And Colin was filled with absolute awe with this. It was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. He was almost couldn't breathe as he was watching the end of all. But of course, Colin Quinn was a man. And as he watched and he watched, it wasn't the beauty and the awe that was filled with his brain that got the better of him. There was other things that started to stir. There was sparks going on inside him, and bits of lightning going on inside him, and bits of volcanoes exploding inside him. And eventually, ah! He jumped out behind the rock and he ran at the woman. And the woman saw him, and they ran hell as they could fast away. And Colin started chasing after them because he wanted those women. <laughs> Well, the first two of them ran down, they got to the shore, they grabbed their swan cloaks, put them on, turned into swans, beat their massive wings, and off they flew. The third one, she was running and running and running, and Connor was almost at her heels when she tripped. And she tripped over a stone, she fell on the ground, and Connor, he just ran right by her. And he ran all the way down to the shore there, and he grabbed her cloak, and he stood up with the cloak, and he turned round, and he began to walk home. And he didn't even look back, because he knew he now had his swan mane in his power. And he walked all the way back to his house. His great castle was in the door there, there was a great fire on, he went up to the great fire, and he held up the cloak. And he turned around, and there was a swan maiden that she was looking at him. She didn't cry, she didn't plead, she just puffed herself up, and she looked at him and she said, I know what you want. Don't burn my cloak. I'll give you what you want. You want it for your wife and your willing wife, but I'll do it on three conditions. One, do not destroy my cloak. Give me a chamber where I can hang it. Two, don't gamble. Because gambling is a sin against God. And three, never bring a member of the O'Brien family back into this house. But Connor was looking at this beautiful woman and he thought, if you save the cloak, 
that was fine. You could give up gambling. And as for the Brian's, the Brian's of the ancient enemies that went anyway, he was never going to have one house anyway. So everything was fine. So, they had a wedding. And it was the most amazing wedding ever. And all the walls of the east of the west of Ireland came. It was a great, great wedding. And they were married and it was funny. And within a year, there was a son born to them. And this was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Because Connor now had an heir he could pass his family on to. And another year passed, and a daughter was born. And this is a great thing as well. Now we have a daughter that can marry off and build alliances with. And suddenly, the corner, the corner up round, began to get a lot of respect and wealth. And some of the people started talking about them again, the Quinns and how powerful they were. And he more and more influential, he gained more and more land and more and more alliances. And seven years went by. And he was feeling very confident in himself and very good in himself with his beautiful wife, his beautiful children, and his power. And one day, the races were on down the cliff. And he went down to the races. And we all know what the races are like in Ireland. It's nothing to do with the bosses, that's just the wee bit on the side. Races are, you know, it's the tent, you better hear, and all that kind of stuff. It's the meeting, the hands, the clapping, the making deals, all that kind of stuff. And Connor went down, didn't gamble, didn't put a bet on he done the wheeling and he done the dealing and he was the best wheeler and dealer there. And he made so many successful rooms and deals. And when the day was finished, he went to a tavern. And in the tavern were all the great men of the West of Ireland. They were all sitting there with their cups and having a great drink and enjoying themselves. And one of them looked up and Connor said, Connor, why weren't you gambling today? Why didn't you put a bet on the horses? And Connor said, Why would I need to gamble? I have everything I have. I couldn't win any more. I have a wife. She's so beautiful, she looks like an angel. I have children, they're so perfect, they look like a little prince and princess. And my land, my land is so rich, the trees in my land are as broad as some people's houses. I have a lake so filled with fish, you could walk across the backs and from one side to the other. I have a house that's so huge, and inside my house there's furnishings and tapestries from the Far East, from China, and all manners of places. Said a voice, and he looked. And there was a fella sitting in the corner, and he said, Listen to you, Connor, the way you're talking, you are thinking of Christ himself. Sure, why don't I get the fella there to bring a bottle with water in it, and you can maybe walk on it, and it shows how marvelous you are. <laughs> or maybe you can turn it into wine for us, because the wine here, that'll happen. Connor's looking at him. And I'll tell you this, I've just had myself a wee bit of Do you want the remains and make a thousand meals with it? Well, Connor didn't bat an eyelid, didn't blush an eye, just looked to the gentleman and said, Well, sir, I hope you're as honest as you are loud mouth and foul mouth. And the fellow down said, What do you mean by that? He said, Well, why don't you come to my house and I will show you that everything I have said is true. And if you're an honest man, you'll come back here and you'll tell everybody. And the fellow down said, Okay, let's do it. And he got up. And Connor got up, and they both had left the tavern, and they got on their horses, and they began riding through the night back to Connor's <laughs> And as they ran through, through the night, they began to talk. And sure, the fellow introduced himself, and wasn't it the O'Brien? Well, O'Quinn, he took a breath, but he thought to himself, it's okay, it's the O'Brien, I'll get into my house so quick, the wife will never know. <laughs> This is the most amazing real estate, the wife of all his <laughs> He got to the house, there was his great castle. He took him out the door and he showed him there's the furnishings and the, the tapestries and the china and the barries. If you look out the window there, you can see the great trees gusting under the moonlight, and over there is the lake with the fish, you can see the fish leaping. And the Brian looked about and said, Ah, it is all true. And the Quinn said, Brian, stop! Out the door, open the door. <laughs> and the Brian looked up and said, Oh, well, I'll tell you this, Connor. I will go back to that tavern and I have to tell every man there that everything you said is absolutely true. But I'll be making sure I tell them that yours is the worst hospitality in the whole of Ireland. <gasps> Says Connor, I'm so sorry, I, I, where are my manners? Come in, come in, come in. And he brought him back into the house and he sat him down and he poured him a cup of wine and a little bit of wine himself. And he was already a little bit drunk. And the wine made him a little bit drunker <laughs> and the bride. Drank a little bit, and he drank a little bit, and she said to feel a little bit confident. And the bride looked at him and said, This is wonderful. Here's you and I drinking like the oldest of friends, and our families have been born for centuries. This is amazing. And the queen was feeling happy, and the bride said to him, 
Why don't we do what friends do in a game of cards? They have a game of cards and they started playing, and then their brand said to Shoo, sure, what's a game of cards without a wee gamble? Oh God, indeed. So, they began gambling. And as they gambled, O'Quinn lost everything. <laughs> he lost the land with the great trees on the side of some folks' house. He lost the lake with the fish so thick on he could walk across the back of them. He lost the tapestries and the functions and the facts up to China. He lost them and the more he lost, the more he gambled because the more he was sure he would get it back. And the more he gambled, the more crazy he got. And the day went on, the night went on, the night went on, and eventually the sun was beginning to come up. And as it was gambling, they gambled and gambled and drinking and drinking and drinking, suddenly Connor heard a noise. And he looked. And he saw his wife's back and into her chamber and slammed her door. <gasps> with that, he grabbed the O'Brien, dragged him to the front door, to hell with hospitality, threw him out, ran back across the chamber, up the stairs, into his wife's room, opened the door, and there stood his wife. And on one side of her was her son, and the other side was her daughter. And in her hand was a swan bow. And Connor reached out to him and she said, Connor, you have no more power over me. And some folks say, that she was weeping. And some folks say she was smiling, but everybody agrees she took the swan cloak and she put it on her. And as she began to transform, one arm turned into a wing, and the wing touched her son, and her son turned into a swan. And as the other arm turned into a wing, it touched her daughter, and her daughter turned into a swan. And then she fully transformed, and the three creatures, they beat their wings, they went up to the great window there, they leapt out, and they flew away into the rising sun. And there stood Connor, having lost all his land, all his furnishings, and now his family. And that was the final ruin of the family of 